is Tom Salemi from OIS TV. I'm at OIS at ASRS, and I'm here with Andrew Gitkin, Managing Director and Head of West Coast Biotech Investment Banking at Piper Jaffray. Thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks for giving the presentation today. Uh, I caught a good part of it. I've had an interview going on, but I did kind of come to the tail, at the tail end of it. And covering ophthalmology, uh, you know, I'm, I'm tracking all the deals that are going on. There's, obviously, this summer has been a lot of interesting uh, acquisitions, the InFocus deal. You know, I'm not going to ask you to focus on anything specifically, but it, there, ten, there seems to be a lot going on. Uh, the Glaucos IPO, the M&A. Is it because I cover ophthalmology that I think there's a lot going on? Is ophthalmology really one of the, uh, hot might be word, but one of the, the, the more active sectors within uh, life sciences? I think ophthalmology as a whole occupies a pretty prominent space or mind share amongst investors, and I would say that both for private investors, but also uh, even public investors, mm -hmm. uh, for a whole host of reasons. Uh, really, it's been an area of tremendous innovation uh, it's been an, uh, an area that has had a lot of you know, notable um, and, and high-flying type M&A exits, which creates a lot of excitement. Um, and there's been, um, e from a fundamental standpoint, a lot of nice components to the overall industry, really around reimbursement uh, and pricing. Um, and from a consolidation standpoint, there tends to be a lot of activity. So mm -hmm. when you sort of take it all together, uh, it, it absolutely continues to be, I believe, one of the top two or three more exciting um, and uh, sectors, and also one of the top two or three areas of most interest among investors. And even you go by year by year, and you can look at how many deals are getting done in ophthalmology, and sometimes it's top two or three, sometimes it's top seven, top 10, whatever it might be. But that, that's sort of, sort of quantitatively. From, from a qualitative standpoint, when you meet investors and you talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, or as a banker, when I meet executives um, at large companies who are looking to consolidate or grow, uh, regardless of what the numbers say, ophthalmology is always a pertinent area of interest mm -hmm. for all of the positive fundamentals I referenced earlier. We've obviously been talking about the, the later stages, about the M&A, but we're, this is an ophthalmology innovation summit. We're talking about innovation. And the two are connected. I mean, you can't have that later stage acquisition if innovation hadn't ha happened earlier on. So what's your sense of the innovation side of, of ophthalmology from where you sit, from looking from high above? Do you see a lot of interesting things going on that have you maybe excited five or seven years down the road, however long these ideas uh, take to develop into products and and get to patients? This is a very exciting time in ophthalmology, uh, innovation, drug discovery, uh, which is an area I tend to focus more on at, at my position at uh, Piper Jaffe on the biopharmaceutical side. Mm -hmm. You see a number of the technologies or approaches that are really in a renaissance, gene therapy, for example, which has been a very exciting area Definitely. in the last couple of years. You see a number of the leaders in that sector uh, really moving forward, very exciting products in ophthalmology. And perhaps more than other therapeutic areas where gene therapy has been tested and experimented with, ophthalmology right now has probably one of the better success track records. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that bodes really well, particularly for back of the eye type indications, which continues to be an area that if I had to choose between back or front of the eye, tends to get a bit more of the investment dollars, a bit more of the focus from investors. But I would also point out very quickly that for, from the front of the eye perspective, um, a number of exciting uh, approaches ongoing there too, in terms of cor correcting vision um, in, in a variety of different ways, both through uh, pharmaceutical approaches and device approaches. Um, and one of the things I love about my, my job, at least, is as a banker, um, you know, sitting on the you know, sort of the front lines of witnessing a lot of this innovation. And ophthalmology, every bit as much as all the hype that oncology gets and, and, and it's justified, is just as innovative. And if you think about how um, treatment will change for a whole host of si significant uh, indications over the next five and 10 years, it's gonna be dramatically different, um, dramatically different. Um, and I, when I talk to uh, optometrists or ophthalmologists, surgeons, um, there are a number of, of indications where you think the treatment is fine and you think you're providing the patient or the person with a nice set of options and outcomes, but when you really start to drill down to it, into it, there's still very much a need, a mm -hmm. medical need, as much as you find in other indications, which I think continues to drive innovation uh, and, and honestly, uh, capital formation into the sector. Sure. So um, I think we're on the front end of what will be a very exciting, I'd call it five to seven year period in ophthalmology. And, and again, connecting the later stage to the early stage, zooming back out to the later stage, we've seen 
so much activity at the, the highest end. I mean, we covered Pfizer Allegan stories mm -hmm. as, uh, as for as long as it went on. And there was a lot of, looking at that deal for a second, there was sort of a lot of hand-wringing that if, if an Allergan becomes part of a Pfizer, does that diminish the influence of ophthalmology, the ophthalmology sector? Because I do think one of the, the strengths of the ophthalmology sector is the fact that there's five or six kind of real robust players elbowing at each other uh, for different products. What do you see at that level? Do you see any consolidation coming? Is that sort of dance come to a close? Is there still a lot of discussion and maybe whispers about this company or that? Uh, what do you see at the highest level in ophthalmology? Yeah, I, I think um, the players that are um, very much in ophthalmology, it's central to what they do, mm -hmm. continue to be very active in trying to build out their uh, capabilities and fill out uh, their product uh, opportunities. Um, there are a number of companies, maybe more on the fringes, where they may have one foot in ophthalmology and, and a foot somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and when you talk to those types of companies, uh, they are absolutely looking for ways to expand their footprint. Uh, some of them are coming at it from a device standpoint and are looking for ways to maybe even integrate pharmaceutical approaches into their device platform. And others are pharmaceutical companies who haven't really had a presence necessary in ophthalmology, but may have it in sort of other ways that are tangential to other diseases that they treat and are looking for ways to get into it as well. So I think from a, a consolidator, large company perspective, uh, the ones that are there continue to be very active. Uh, I think they're, they're constantly looking ways to improve their product offerings and their, and their development programs. Um, but I'd also point out there's a, a, a number of other companies as well, without getting to names, who um, have expertise, let's say, in optics. Mm -hmm. um, or vision from a different perspective and have a mandate to expand into healthcare. Uh, well, the crosshairs really do line up pretty well in ophthalmology. Um, and, and we do see those types of companies um, very much getting part of the conversation now. Hmm. So, I mean, ophthalmology is an intersection of so many different disciplines. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, is it possible that we may see some more players added to this, this, this roster going forward? We might have some more some new masters of the industry up there on our stage in a year or two? I think if you would ask those companies in, in, in the uh, you know, protective atmosphere of a board meeting when they're talking about five-year and seven-year visions, they would like to think of themselves potentially being that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they have the wherewithal to do it. Um, but we'll see. It's a very competitive uh, sector. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones that have a leg up, the ones that we all know, the common names, you know, the, the, the top three or four guys who are in the space, make it a little harder for uh, new companies to come into it because they have an ability to um, compete in a way that they can. They have more knowledge. They can move quicker uh, because they're more comfortable, so they understand risk better, if mm -hmm. you will. They get more comfortable with it. Um, and they can leverage those sort of expertise, if you will, to be ultra-competitive um, in a potential uh, sale process. Um, so for those that want to get into it, they're going to have to, I think, get a little bit into, um, get a little uncomfortable, if you will, um, and that will come down to what their true commitment is. So you won't really know what it's going to look like until they test it, mm -hmm. but my sense is that you are going to see a couple of other names added to that list of maybe not quite the top three, mm -hmm. but there'll be a close sort of tier two beneath it that can be very, very acquisitive and active. Interesting. And, and you mentioned earlier uh, you cover biotech primarily and you referenced oncology. I'm curious, where does ophthalmology sort of fit in, I don't know if there's a pecking order, it's not the right term, but within other diseases uh, in the biotech sector, is it uh, still one of the, 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 uh, the smaller ones uh, that's, that's growing, or where would you sort of place it in, uh, in the specialties within biotech? Um, it's, it's, not, it's not going to be like oncology, yeah. understandably, um, and that's okay. Um, but when you look at um, how um, cell site research analysts across the street, um, what their coverage list looks like, uh, many of them have companies that are you know, ophthalmology companies in it. Um, and because, as you said a few moments ago, um, it's a cross-section. Ophthalmology is a real cross-section uh, of a number of different specialties. And as different type of drug discovery um, and uh, interventional uh, approaches have evolved in the past couple of years, mm -hmm. cell therapy, uh, regenerative medicine, gene therapy, uh, understanding just um, uh, biology better now than we ever did before, obviously. Um, that's ripe for, for biotech minds to think about it uh, and understand how there could be a nice nexus um, 
in their expertise, and we're seeing that. Um, I keep coming back to gene therapy, but a very exciting area that didn't really think about that in ophthalmology until the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe that alongside oncology, um, alongside um, immunotherapy uh, uh, indications or autoimmune indications, um, infectious disease type indications, you're going to see ophthalmology occupy a place there, a, a real mind share amongst the biotech community, all of which will be facilitated um, if we continue to see positive data. We saw some nice data last year out of Spark and a late stage ophthalmology indication. Sure. Um, and if we get more of that, and there is more sort of coming, if you will, in terms of data events, that would only sort of add fuel to the fire. And I think you'll see more um, mind share, if you will, both from a, a sell side perspective on Wall Street and also from a buy side perspective, thinking about investors, be allocated to it. That's a perfect segue to my final question. What are we going to be looking back on in, in OIS uh, 2018? Over the next couple of years, what successes, what milestone achievements do you hope to see happening uh, in this space? Exquisite solutions to um, afflictions that affect a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. I think you're, the, the, we're, in a, we're in a period of time now where I think the um, technology has gotten so advanced, clinical trial design has gotten so refined um, that companies now that may not be so large and have the, the, the resources of a large company are going to be able to tap into the potential of products on their own that treat significant markets. Um, and I think we'll begin to see evidence of that over the next couple of years, which will create a very interesting dynamic uh, in the coming years. So I think if we're in 2018, we're sitting here talking, we're going to look back and there's going to probably be two or three real landmark um, developments, maybe not on the market yet, but where it's essentially been de-risked and you know there's a signal there. Mm -hmm. And then you extrapolate that to what the commercial potential could be, um, both what um, could be both on market as well as potentially off label in terms of how it may work, I think you could see some very significant opportunities. Great. I look forward to your presentation at OIS 2018. Thanks for joining <laughs> us. Happy to be here. Mm -hmm.